I heard this uh, series from, from Jeff Paul out of Indianapolis, a suburb of Indianapolis, and uh, I really, I really uh, found it very helpful and uh, enjoyable. We're talking all the time about how to share the good news, share the good news, the importance of the last, the great commission of Christ uh, to go and preach the gospel, good news. And, and all the focus on doing that, we sometimes just drop the ball on the simple things that make it possible. So this is, uh, we're continuing on. Today we're on number four. But if you remember the previous three Sundays, uh, we looked at, uh, do you know my name? Again, these are five questions. Everybody really, as you build a friendship, relationship, they just want you to know. And how important, you can't know everybody's name, but to know somebody's name. To that person means a whole lot. So do you know my name? Do you know what matters to me? Do you know uh, where I live? We looked last week. Remember how Jesus made all those house calls in his ministry. Uh, today we're looking at, uh, do you know what I've done? And next week, if the Lord allows, we'll be looking at, do you know what I'm capable of or what I can do? Um, so, and we've looked at each, each of these questions, how Jesus, it's a name basis. He, Simon Peter, for example, he knew Simon's name. Andrew went and brought his brother, and he said, you're Simon, but you'll be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So it's a name relation. Then uh, he knew what mattered to Peter, and that's why he's at the Sea of Galilee where Peter's fishing. Then he went into Peter's home, healed Peter's mother-in-law. And today we're going to see how uh, uh, Jesus knew all about Peter's failures. Now, we're going to use the text from Luke chapter 22. As we look today, do you know what I've done? It's an introspective look for each of us to look at ourselves as we consider this question. Do you know what I've done? Luke 22, at the Last Supper... Uh, Jesus, Jesus says to Simon Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we are so thankful that although you know everything we've done, uh, you still love us. We thank you for your grace. It is amazing and it is saving. It's our only hope. We pray that you're pleased and glorified through us as your words presented here today. As we sing praises to your name, as we have broken here the bread of life today, now we pray that we just bring you glory. We ask for increase. Increase our number and increase our faith. As we praise and thank you today, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So many people are defined by the sins that they've committed. And we know uh, guilt and shame. Spouses divorce. Kids won't speak to their parents. Good people stay away from some people. No one wants to hire that person. Old friends have nothing to do with them. They're known by something they've done. A failure of their past defines who they are. He's a coward. She's an adulterer. He's an embezzler. She's a liar. He's a hypocrite. They're a traitor, a jerk, a drunk, a workaholic. Sin defines who they are. And we're here with the message that Christ brings is that you're greater than all of your sin. Greater than all of your sin is the grace of God that can save your soul. That's our message. And what we can do, although we're not here to tolerate sin, overlook it, no, but we can show mercy to those who are repentant. We can show commitment to people, the well-being of other people, and call them upward in the name of Christ and hold them accountable. The truth of the matter that we have to focus on in Jesus is that people are redeemable. Is this, is this thing on? Uh, people are redeemable. Truly, it's our only, it's our only hope. Uh, have you noticed who Jesus spends time with in his ministry? You notice who Jesus spends time with? He goes into Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Couldn't see. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. He's a tax collector. Jesus went into his house. Jesus spent time with him. And Jesus attended a party at Matthew's house full of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus let an immoral woman anoint, his feet and wa anoint him and wash his feet. He kept a mob from stoning a woman that was caught in adultery. Jesus did. Jesus conversed with a disreputable woman at the town well. He ate with a self-righteous uh, legalist. He tried to save a self-serving rich man, a rich young ruler. 
He healed a lame man who later turned him in to religious officials just to save his own skin. He recruited 12 men and closest friends in spite of all their failures and betrayals. Jesus, Jesus didn't let what people were guilty of keep him from loving them and trying to disciple them. Praise the Lord. It's our only hope. Here in this passage in Luke chapter 22, at the Last Supper, Jesus is only hours from going to Calvary uh, to experience death on our, for, for us in, on our behalf. Substitutionary, he died for us. Just hours before he goes at the Last Supper, Jesus says this, notice, it's prophetic, it's predictive, and it's, it's the way Jesus, he knows, what, he knows what's going to happen before it happens. More than that, Jesus, he intercedes for the Apostle Peter. <laughs> we know in 1, Peter, uh, 1 Timothy, we know in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says, There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. He mediates for us. He intercedes for us. And in this passage, look what it says. Simon, I have prayed for you before it happens. It's like he intercedes before it happens, while it's happening, and after it happens. There's one mediator. He's on our side. Jesus is. Jesus Christ is our advocate. He is for us. I'm, I, I, Jonathan, I need a new battery in this thing. Does the Bible still say in Psalm 100, verse 1, does it still say, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth? <laughs> I reckon it does. Uh, Christ is on our side. Look at what he did. He said, Peter, Simon's uh, uh, asked for you. He wants to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. And that your faith may not fail when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, Simon Peter says, oh, Lord, Lord, I'll go to prison for you, Lord. I'll lay down my life for you, Lord. Jesus responds. I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. And Jesus knows what Peter's going to do. Now, as we start in the sermon today, I want to give you some food for thought just for you Bible nerds out there. That when Jesus said, uh, before the rooster crows today... You'll deny that you know me three times. When Jesus said that, uh, before the rooster crows, it might not mean. You can take it or leave it. If you don't want to take it, you can leave it. But it is possible, consider, hear me out here, consider this possibility, that when he said, uh, when the rooster crows, it might not be an actual bird. See, the, the word for when the rooster crows, or cock crowing, as King James says, it comes from the Latin word, which really meant the sounding of a trumpet. At the change of a guard. So for the Romans, the Romans broke, especially the night time, they broke it in three-hour shifts. You had from evening time, six to nine. Then you had from nine to midnight. Then you had from midnight to 3 a.m. And then you had from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And notice Jesus even uses, Jesus even uses this distinction in Mark chapter 13. Look with me. Mark 13, verse 15. Jesus said, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the hour, I'm sorry, you do not know the when, you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. Whether in evening, 6 to 9 p.m., or at midnight, 9 till midnight, or when the rooster crows, midnight to 3 a.m., or at dawn. See, we think of the rooster crowing, we think of dawn. But notice how Jesus distinguished the rooster crowing, the sounding of the trumpet, the cock crowing in the Latin phrase, which means the trumpet sounding. He separates, distinguishes that from six in the morning. Now, I throw this at you. It's just, it's just a total fun tidbit. Combined with the fact that some Jewish historians like Josephus, Josephus tells us that uh, roosters were not permitted in the city of Jerusalem during the Passover feast. So if there was no rooster there, then it wasn't a real bird that crowed. You can take it or leave it. I still think it's a rooster crow. Hoo, 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 hoo. That's all right. You can still believe that. It doesn't change. doesn't change anything. Just, just a little food for thought. That it might not be an actual bird. Food for thought. Jesus, Peter says, Lord, I go to prison for you. Lord, I lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, no. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Well, let's see how it comes out. 
The Bible says there, following on in Luke 22, starting verse 54, it says, Then seizing him, that's Jesus, they led him away and they took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. Got to give him credit because all the disciples didn't follow, but Peter did. Peter followed at a distance, but when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. The Passover happens in the spring of the year. We, we celebrate what we call Easter, many of us. And it's, you think about it, it's warm sometimes during the day. Oftentimes it's cold at night. John chapter 18 says it was cold. They kindled a fire to keep warm. So Peter, he sees the fire. It's cold. He goes to warm himself and he sat down. Well, there at the fire, a servant girl looked at him, seated there in the firelight. She looked closely. She said, this man was with him. But he denied it. She said, this man here was with Jesus. And Peter denied it. Woman, I don't know him, Peter said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. <laughs> man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Uh, it's, it's noted uh, that uh, the Galileans had an accent, just like... Uh, just like there are people in the world who have an accent. Now, I know that we don't have an accent. But there are other people out there that do have an accent. You know what I mean? Like Ohio people, you know, Indiana people, you know. But, uh, see, geographically, region to region, there, there's an accent. And this guy said, he's a Galilean. His accent gives it away. Surely you were with him. You're one of them. He's a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking. The rooster crowed. This is the morning after. You remember just a few hours er earlier in the evening, the night before, uh, Peter said, Lord, I'll go with you to prison. Lord, I'll even lay down my life for you. And this is the morning after. The morning after. The morning after is uh, something we can all relate to, no matter uh, what level of sin you've committed, but uh, the morning after. After words have escaped from your mouth, after the deed has been done, the morning after the crime has been committed, you wake up an adulterer or a liar or a murderer or an abuser. Did I just send those altered documents? Did I just utter that false statement? Did I just wake up with that person? I just got convicted. I can't believe this. Did that really happen to me? No matter, no matter the degree of sin you've committed, we can all relate to this idea of the morning after. Things went too far. Things occurred that we didn't anticipate. We wasn't planning on, but we did it. We're wrong. We're guilty. And we wake up the next, next morning with, with egg on our face. We're just shame and guilt and embarrassment. Apostle Peter's the morning after. Uh, one version says that he, he called down, uh, I believe it's in Mark's gospel, but it says when he denied Jesus, he called down curses from heaven. I don't know the man. Lord, I'll die for you. I'll go to prison. I'll even die for you. The Bible says when the rooster crowed, it says uh, Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter had left his fishing boat and his fishing dreams at the Sea of Galilee some three years prior, and he went to follow Jesus. And for three years, he's, he's made a living with Jesus, following, teaching, preaching. Jesus sent Peter and the others out two by two. And all that he's experienced, all, he's, all that he's gone through for three years now, this is the last time that we know that Peter sees Jesus face to face before Jesus suffers at Calvary. The rooster crowed, and Jesus, wherever he was in detainment, he could see Peter, and Peter could see him. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you'll disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. We consider the question here, question number four, do you know what I've done? The truth of the matter is that we serve a God who knows everything that we've done. He knows things that you and I thought about doing we didn't have the courage or audacity to do. He knows about that too. He knows about stuff. You, you didn't say it. You minded, your, you minded your manners. But you thought about saying it. He knows everything you've thought about saying or doing. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything you've said. He knows the anger in your heart that fueled the words that you said. He knows. He knows everything. 
And can you hear what, what the Spirit's saying to us? The Spirit's saying to the church, when you, when you read through the, the sacrifice that Jesus endured at Calvary and what happened thereafter and how Peter is related here in the middle of it, in Luke 20, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Mark's Gospel, in Mark's Gospel, just a few days later on Resurrection Day, the women go to the tomb and they find an angel, an angel there. And the angel said, you know, Jesus is risen. But notice what the angel said in Mark 16. The angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. There's somebody specific of the 11 apostles still living at that point in time. There's somebody specifically that the angel said, you go tell all the disciples and be sure to tell Peter. Huh. Jesus is going ahead of you in the Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Moreover, Jesus did appear to Peter. The Bible says in Luke 24, you remember there's, there's two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Seven miles from Jerusalem, these guys walk on the road. Jesus appears with them. Well, when, when Jesus leaves them, they go back to Jerusalem. And when they go back to Jerusalem, do you, you, know what, you know what the apostles tell them? Listen, it says Luke 24... Uh, these men got up, they returned to Jerusalem. When they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, and they found them saying, it is true. The Lord has risen has appeared to Simon. Go tell Simon. Tell all my disciples, but tell Simon. Moreover, the Lord appeared to Simon. We know this is true. And not only the importance in Mark's gospel, not only here in Luke 24, but also Paul wrote it. 1 Corinthians 15, hear what the Spirit says to the church. What I received, what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to, to Peter. And then to the twelve. The idea that Jesus, Peter, the last time he saw him, Peter was denying Jesus. I don't know the man. His failure, his sin, the guilt, the shame. He went outside, he wept bitterly. Jesus makes a point to appear to reinstate Peter. Jesus knew what was going to happen. We saw it in Luke 20. Sorry about that. We, Jesus saw it. We saw it in Luke uh, 22 where uh, Jesus said, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I, I pray for you, Simon. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. Uh, in addition to all this that we've seen here, how Jesus appeared to Simon, you also have that account in John chapter 21 where Jesus appears while the boys are fishing Jesus appears to them and he tells Simon, uh, Simon Peter, three times in John 21, he says, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. He reinstates Peter. He's telling Peter, Peter, don't you know I love you? Get back in the game. I know what you've done. Get back in the game. Don't let sin be the last word for you. Don't run from me. Don't run from your calling. Don't go back to your old life. Neither do I condemn you. Can you hear what the Spirit says to the church? Jesus says to Peter, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Peter, God's not finished with you yet. He, he knows everything you've done. He knows the curses. He knows the betrayal. He knows the humiliation you brought him. He's got plans for you. You hear how important that is for me and you? Because we're still struggling. God knows everything we've done, but He loves us. He's willing to work with us and work through us. If only we'll submit to His, his calling, His purpose, be obedient to His commands. And we're looking at what our takeaways. What our takeaways are. We know what Peter did. What about us? What are our takeaways today? Well, uh, God's kindness, number one, God's kindness is our only hope. Our only hope is just the goodness of God. And you know, you read through the Old Testament, you have all these rules, more than 300 imperative statements, commands, commanding statements, highlighted the Old Testament by the Ten Commandments, but we can't keep those commandments. In fact, we fall short. You can never keep enough commandments to earn heaven. It's impossible. That's why Jesus died at Calvary. As far as the Ten Commandments go, I don't know if I share with this group or not, but my boys go to Christ Central School there in Pike County. Deacon had an exercise. He was working on the Ten Commandments. And, and you had the Ten Commandments at the top of the page. At the bottom of the page, you'd read through some scenarios. And it asked you, which commandment have you broken? And it said, uh, it said, your friend, your best friend gets a brand new toy, and you want it really, really bad. 
which commandment have you broken? Well, the right answer is commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet. But Deacon didn't put number 10. He put number 8. And you go back up 10 commandments, you get down to number 8, and it says, thou shall not steal. <laughs> and he knows what that covenant leads to. I said, son, are you going to take that boy's toy? I mean, come on. <laughs> and what are we teaching you? Stealing's wrong, son. What's the matter with you? Uh, but you got to appreciate his honesty. You know, what does that lead you to? And he's not too familiar. Coveting is not a word we use a whole lot. But the Ten Commandments, all these rules about God and God's holiness, and the cross is saying we can't earn it. It's only by God's goodness. God did the unthinkable. He stepped in. God became one of us. He was clothed in human skin, human likeness, just like you and I. He overcame temptation. He laid his life down. He did it. His death at Calvary was substitutionary. Jesus truly died in our place so we can live. Woo! God's goodness is our only hope. Paul wrote to Titus and he said this. He said, at one time, Titus, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of His mercy. God's goodness is our only hope. When we consider this question, people out there are different than us. They look different than us. They might have different struggles than what you have. We all struggle. Everybody's different. They might struggle with substances or whatever, or, or drinking alcohol, or, or pornography, or, or, or sexual uh, orientation. I don't want people to struggle with. It's different than you, but still, they're sinners in need of God's grace. We have to realize the only hope there is, the only hope that I have, that you can have, and the only hope that anybody can have is in God's goodness. God knows what we've done. And he still loves us. Our only hope is in his goodness. Number two, I, I, I read this, uh, is, or heard that this comes through, uh, uh, through there, was a, there was a rehab program that had this statement. I love how this applies for us as, as Christians. When it says here, uh, there is, there's what's true about a person. And then, there's the truth about a person. Now see, for you and I, well, there are things that we've done. we said it, we've done it, we can't undo it. We can't undo yesterday. Oh, how I wish we could, you know. We can't undo yesterday. Those things are true. But that's not the truth about us. The truth about us as Christians in Christ, the truth about us is we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We're forgiven. We're set free. That's the truth of the matter. When, when the devil, I've heard it said, I've heard it said the devil, the devil owns a travel agency and he specializes in guilt trips. I also heard it said when the devil, when the devil reminds you of your past failures, you remind him of his future. And boy, I know where he ends up, casting the lake of fire. He's a loser, he's a loser. That dude, we know where he's going. And we stay focused. The truth of the matter is we're forgiven. The truth of the matter, in Ephesians chapter 2, because of his great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. The truth of the matter, as said more expressly in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, says, uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. What's true about us doesn't control. It's the truth that matters. That's Jesus Christ is king. It makes all the difference. Our only hope's in God's goodness. We're focusing on the truth that he brings for us. Thirdly, finally, lastly, we must demonstrate transformation and acceptance and hope transformation the world in this part of in this neck of the woods maybe in some metropolis area out there with hundreds of thousand people maybe there are people out there who never heard the gospel i believe in in eastern kentucky everybody's familiar to some degree with christianity but i believe that they're they're begging the world would love to see, really, if, if, you're, if you've got something different than what everybody else claims to have, show me what it looks like. If you're really, if, if you're in Christ, the old is gone, the new is come. what does that look like? How, how ought a Christian to do the job you do? How ought a Christian run a business like you run? How ought a business, uh, how ought a Christian ought to treat people and their family? How should we treat one another? 
trans transformation, acceptance, hope. Well, what is a real McCoy? What does it look like? Should we not be an example? Does God not know what we've done, what we've said, what we thought? Aren't we hoping in his goodness? And if that's the way God's treated us and he wants us to be like him, how should we treat other people? Well, they look a little different than us. Well, they, they got tattoos all over them. Praise the Lord. They, there's not a person out there covered tattoos from top to bottom that God didn't love and Jesus didn't die for. Well, they, they got different religious beliefs than I did. They, they wear those things on their heads. And there's not a suicide bomber out there that Jesus Christ didn't die for. We just got to try and reach them with the gospel. Do you know what I've done? Consider that question introspectively. Ourselves, us looking in the mirror. God knows what we've done. He loves us anyway. And you see how this, this verse from 1 Peter ties this series of lessons together? When Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, as the praise team comes up, uh, Peter writes these words, uh, Love one another deeply 